Hey, Melissa, how are you? I'm great. How are you? What's going on, Toledo today? It's beautiful weather. How about you? I tell you what, I think it's beautiful all over the state. Everybody I talk to today, they say it's great weather. So Cut I just fall. was. I just talked to Lima, and they said it was great in Lima. So that's good, and it's beautiful here. We're, we live now. We, we live down near Dayton, so that's where I am right now in our house in Cedarville. So it's been it's been a beautiful day today. Yeah, so. there's definitely a touch of fall in the air. I think. Yeah, yeah, well, starting to see some leaves. Buckeye trees are starting to leaves starting to fall. So I want you to Erica, send me one of those. I saw you give one away on one of your uh, earlier news conferences. I would love one. My, we're big Buckeyes fans. Are you a big Buckeye mm -hmm. fan? There you go. Well, I'll see if I can get you one. Oh, uh, I would love that. Gr gr growing on our farm. How's that? There you go. <laughs> All right, Governor, we are. Uh, Eric, are you set? Eric, we're, Eric says we're set here, so whenever you're ready. Okay. So let's talk about uh, Labor Day weekend. I know you have a big warning for people. We saw a big spike in numbers after the July 4th weekend. So I guess what is your message to Ohioans who want to get out and kind of celebrate that last big day of summer? Well, I hope everybody has a great Labor Day weekend. It looks like the weather, uh, most of Ohio, it looks like it's going to be good. Um, so we just want people to be careful. Uh, we've got a lot at stake. Uh, we've got kids back in school. We want to keep these schools open. We've got college kids back in college. Um, just a lot of things going on. And so it's just really important that we, you know, keep the spread of the virus down. Um, we can't seem to get our numbers down. We, you know, we still have 12, 1,300 new cases uh, every single day. We're, we've uh, been able to avoid the big um, surges that we've seen in some other states. So we're very thankful for that. Ohioans, I think, have done a great job, uh, but we just need to kind of hang in there and keep doing it. Governor, from the very beginning, I remember you saying in your news conferences, we really wanted to flatten the curve and draw out the cases. It wasn't that we didn't expect that people would get coronavirus, but we wanted to provide that space in our hospitals for patients who wanted to provide ventilators and PPE. It seems that we've done that. Yet, a lot remains closed. Kids, a lot of times, are on virtual learning plans strictly. Has this changed? Are we now saying we want to avoid getting coronavirus altogether? Or is there still a need for hospitals and PPE and ventilators? I think we've always had the same goals. The goals have been, let's save lives. Um, let's flatten the curve. Uh, we know some people will get it. We want as few people to get it as possible. And we want to make sure that our hospitals are not overflowing like we saw in Italy or for a while in, in New York. So, you know, we've done pretty well. Uh, but we're at 4.5% positivity. Uh, there's some other states that are 2 or 1. Um, we, if we're going to, you know, continue to open up our society if we're going to be able to live our lives, um, you know, we've got to keep the virus, I almost say under control. You can't really keep it under control, but at least at least keep it down. So what we're seeing in, in some counties, it varies by county. Um, you know, when people really started wearing masks in the urban areas, uh, when we put the, the mask order on, frankly, uh, we saw the cases go down. Um, what we have not seen is that happen in the rural areas. In fact, what's different about now than last spring is that in the rural areas, the cases have really spread out to those areas. So we have some counties, for example, in western Ohio, rural counties, uh, that are two times what uh, the number of uh, cases there are in, in, in Toledo or, or in Columbus. So uh, it's pretty widespread uh, in some of our rural counties, and that just creates problems. And I want to talk about Lucas County for a minute because our health commissioner has said that our infection rate is about 5%, which by definition I've seen is still within the controlled margin. Yet we still remain one of seven counties that are in the red. And I want to read some statistics to you. A Lucas County averaged fewer than one hospitalization a day for the past two weeks. Since the beginning of August, we saw about four hospitalizations a day. Now, if you do compare that to counties which are similar in size, like Montgomery County and Summit County, our rates are two and a half times lower for hospitalizations than theirs. We remain red. I think people are frustrated about that, and we want to know 
what is that criteria? How do we get out of red? Sure, and, and we, we published this. Uh, and first of all, let me just say, you know, there's no penalty for being red. Uh, this is just a uh, opportunity to tell people in the county, you know, how much spread is in the county, and also, you know, what are the trend lines? So we've got seven, seven indicators, uh, and we look at those indicators every single week. Some of them are early warning signs, for example, the number of people who are showing up in the emergency room and who are diagnosed with COVID, the number of people who go into their doctor's offices with, have, with symptoms of, of COVID. These are early, early warning signs. The hospitalizations are much, you know, much, much later. So there's no, there's no penalty for being red. The decisions about going to school, whether you do it remote or whether you do it in person, those are decisions we've left up to the local community. Those are not my decisions. Those I are know the decisions you've been of the clear about board. that. Yeah. yeah, you've been clear about yeah, that. Yeah. However, I would say you said there's no penalty for being red. I think that a lot of the local school districts do follow the county. So when the county says red, the school districts may think, okay, we need to stay closed. Is there going to be a mandate? How can a taxpayer, how can a parent ensure that schools are working the hardest they possibly can to create that safe social distance at a minimum of three feet, ideally more, also with enough cleaning supplies. How can taxpayers and parents know that their school district is working toward that goal and what can they do if the school district seems to just say, no, we're gonna stay closed? That's certainly not the best thing for our children. Well, we live in a democracy, and, and we live in a state where we believe in local control, uh, and the taxpayers control the school, and the taxpayers elect a school board, and the school board represents those taxpayers. So we have 635 school districts or, or so in the state of Ohio, and so they're all different. And uh, one of the things that, you know, as I've talked to superintendents, I've, I, I've talked to parents, their message to me has been, Mike, hey, our district is different. You know, we know what's best. In my own case, uh, we live here in, in Cedarville. We've got uh, a community that's decided to have school uh, in place. We've got grandkids who are going to school every single day. Five miles away in Yellow Springs, we have other grandchildren, and that community has decided, no, we're going to do remote. So these are decisions that are made at the local level uh, by people that we trust with, with our kids and by parents and families. Can you see how then maybe even your own kids or people who are neighbors of neighbors are frustrated by the discrepancy, the seeming discrepancy? And if there is no recall in place or if there's no a board member up for re-election anytime soon, how, again, do the parents well, take action if look, they want their kids in school? A lot of them say that there is an option for online school if that's all you want to do, but there is no option for in-person learning. Again, we either believe in democracy or we don't. We either believe in local control or we don't. Um, you know, this, the parents, what the parents should do, if they don't like the decision made by the school board, if they don't like the decision made by the superintendent, they should do what we always do, which is complain, write letters, uh, show up at board meetings, you know, make it clear. Um, people have the ability to, to move a school board. They have the ability to move a superintendent. Look, they work for the for the public. So I understand the frustration. Uh, we have people on the other side in some communities where they're going back in person who say, you know, I don't want that. I don't think that that is, that is correct. So what we've tried to do from the state's perspective is to give schools all the best information that we can find. We've tried to give the communities and the schools information about what is the status of COVID in your community right now. But ultimately, the decision about what they do is up to that local community, just like many other decisions about schools are left up to that local community. Governor, it's been several weeks now since you mandated that bars and restaurants stop serving alcohol after 10 p.m. We just did a story last night. A lot of these business owners are worried about the continuation of this, especially with the colder months coming in Ohio and the fact that patios will no longer be open as the weather turns colder. How, in your opinion, has your plan to stop serving alcohol after 10 been working? And 
When can those business owners expect an update on how long this could last? Well, again, our numbers are not going in the right direction. We were able to take our positivity numbers down for about six weeks. That was good. Now they're going back up, and we expect them to go back as kids go back to school. Um, so this was a balance. Um, you know, the White House came in, uh, Dr. Burke came in, and she said, you know, our strong recommendation is you close every bar in this state. That was the recommendation. Uh, we didn't follow that uh, because we know these are small businessmen and women, uh, but we felt a reasonable compromise was to cutting liquor off at 10 o'clock. Liquor has to be off, off the table by 11 o'clock. Uh, that has cut back on some of the spread. That has cut back on some of the things uh, that go on in bars. Look, later at night, uh, the more people drink, the less uh, socially inhibited they are, uh, and the more spread that you have. Uh, that's just you know, the way it is. But we felt that this was a compromise that let these businesses continue to operate, but at the same time, you know, took some of the air out of the balloon and tried to slow this thing down a little bit. Our TV station is located in downtown Toledo, so I drive in and out every day, and I happened to notice uh, the other day how many small businesses, restaurants are now closed all together. And, you know, similar to a, an area like Columbus or Cleveland, you see large corporations that exist downtown, and then you have, you know, little mom-and-pop restaurants and bars and things like that that open up to help the lunchtime crowd, to make money off of this. My concern is in the future, with so many corporations saying, hey, we can do business virtually now. We don't need to bring in all these people into one building in a downtown area. What is the future of a downtown Toledo going to look like? Has that been discussed? Is it a concern? And is your administration working with these corporations on some sort of plan to come back downtown so that everything can survive that came down here to begin with? Well, look, I think it's a real question. Uh, people have been working from home. Uh, people a lot smarter than Mike DeWine would have to project in a year or two years what that looks like. Are people liking working at home? Are businesses finding that works? Or are they finding it doesn't work? I, I get kind of mixed results. But I think that's going to determine to a great extent what happens in these buildings downtown, not just Toledo, but in every other city, city in the country. So this is a big... You know, this has been a big change with people working from home. Um, you know, I love vibrant cities. So, you know, I worry about this as well, frankly. Governor, do you plan to get a coronavirus vaccine and for your family when it comes out? Are you confident that it'll come out as been suggested even next month? Well, I don't know the date. I mean, they've told us to be ready to start distributing uh, around November 1. Whether they hit that date or not, you know, I, I have no idea. Uh, but we're working on this. We were working on it, frankly, this morning, a uh, meeting we had talking about, you know, where are the priorities, um, you know, and how do we make sure that we get the distribution out as fast as we can. What we'd expect is that, you know, there may be two, maybe three different vaccines, different manufacturers. Uh, so, you know, Going to have to keep track of that. Uh, you know, some of these may be two, two series of shots. Um, so there's just so much that, frankly, we don't know. But we're getting ready. Uh, I know that, that the federal government will come out with priorities about who should get that. We're going to follow the priorities. So uh, as to your question about what I'm going to do or what Fran's going to do, uh, you know, I, I think we're going to follow the protocol. And uh, when it's our turn uh, to get to get the shot, we'll, we'll get the shot. Governor DeWine, thanks so much for your time today. We certainly appreciate it. Good to be with you. Thank you very much.